Good morning. It's good to see all of you here, even despite the big snowfall that we had. I really enjoy snow. So um, so this morning I'm going to read to us from Revelation 3, um, verses 14 up to the end of the chapter, which is up to verse 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and soft to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May the Lord add blessing to his word. Thank you, Ingrid. Let's pray. Father, we invite you to speak to us by your Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, we can come to this book and walk away with nothing unless your Spirit reveals to us what you're teaching. And so we ask even as we look intently into your Word, your perfect Word that reveals to us our sin, your perfect Word that teaches us everything we need for faith and in how we should obey, pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and empower us and motivate us to live in a life worthy of the man, or sorry, and life worthy of your calling, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. For his glory we ask it. Amen. The last of Jesus' seven messages to the churches, and he addresses the church in Laodicea, an extremely wealthy and self-sufficient church. If there's another second church that we have a lot in common with, it is this church. Uh, I I felt so strongly as we talked about the church in Ephesus that this was really something that God was speaking to our church about. And the the same is here with Laodicea. They have an interesting circumstance that is so much like ours. Uh, Like all of the other cities that were in this valley that these letters are written to, Laodicea was destroyed uh, by the earthquake, um, I believe it was in the year 17, but don't, don't fact check me on that. <laughs> Laodicea was so wealthy that it was a point of pride that when the massive earthquake had destroyed so many of these cities, uh, Laodicea had rebuilt bigger and better and refused imperial assistance. So not only did they not need help to rebuild, but everything was rebuilt bigger and better. They had fabulous uh, dwellings and fabulous public spaces. It was a city of enormous wealth, and they enjoyed every possible benefit and comfort available in that day and age, all except one, and we'll talk about that. But they they had everything going for them, uh, just like we do here in North America. And and Laodicea becomes the climax of Jesus' warnings to the churches. He has nothing good to say about this church that is given over completely to compromise with their culture and compromise with the things of this earth that they value. And he writes to the angel of the church in Laodicea, verse 14, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And all of these introductions, uh, the title Jesus refers to himself with are very relevant to the church that received them. And Laodicea is no exception. Jesus announces himself as the Amen, which is a very strange title to us, because this is the word most Christians, I think, maybe think is only the ending of a prayer. 
And, and Jesus is actually drawing a, connota- uh, a correlation or a co- connection to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 16, but it's, it's easily missed in our English translations because they don't use a man. Uh, Isaiah 65, 16 just part of it here is, He who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth. Now what, what God's saying here is that there's only one stable thing. There's only one thing to swear by. And there's only one thing to bless oneself by because God is the only uh, pillar, unmovable in, in all of the universe. He is, I was going to say in creation, but he's not part of creation. Nothing that is, is created has the same uh, sense of unmovability and immutability. That means he, he's not changed as God. But in the Hebrew, God is uh, Elohim Amen, the God of truth. Amen is just truth. And so when Jesus uses both Amen and true in his title, he's making this connection super solid. Uh, by using the Hebrew original and the Greek translation of the passage. And so God's title as the God of truth, expressing that this reality that the only certain thing, the only reliable entity in existence is God himself, is applied now to Jesus. Yet another Old Testament title for God. Jesus announces himself here as the God of the Old Testament and the one in whom there is absolute certainty. Jesus is the one in whom this church can have absolute certainty. Now, this is important because they have put their trust and their hope in other things. And so Jesus is the Amen, the true. He has remained a faithful witness despite temptation, becoming Philippians chapter 2, 8, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus is not just the true God. He is also the true and faithful witness. Jesus was tempted, Matthew 4, by the devil with comfort, food, while he was starving. He was tempted with status and worldly power. How many of you know these are the temptations that come to us? The temptation of comfort, the temptation of status, worldly power and authority. Jesus did not waver, all for the glory and the joy which awaited his obedience. He did these things for the joy that was set before him. But this is all in very sharp contrast with the church in Laodicea. Jesus' title would be themselves a rebuke to a church that had failed to be faithful or true in bearing witness for Christ. They had compromised, as many of these churches had. In fact, this idea of the faithful witness becomes the the most correlated title of those who would eventually receive all of heaven's blessings. And is also the title that is most magnified in Jesus throughout the book of Revelation, the, the title of a faithful witness, the one who bears witness no matter the cost, the one who shares the gospel even when the people will hate them and ultimately kill them for it. Jesus is the creator. John 1, 3. He has ultimate authority over all things. And this is who addresses the church in Laodicea. So we, we have this moment of a wake up, Pay attention, God himself is speaking here. And then he says, I know your works, verse 15. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. To say that Jesus is not pleased with this church is is an understatement. You make me want to vomit is, is probably the intended message here. It's, it's what it probably is intended in the original language. The, the charge made against this church is that they are lukewarm. And this is an accusation that has often been taken to mean that their zeal for Jesus had mellowed out and their faith was no longer hot passion, but it had cooled to lukewarm. It, it's not quite cold yet, but it's, it's lukewarm. It's in the middle. And the problem with this interpretation that is very popular, in fact, if if you believe that that's what this means, I I don't blame you. That's what I believed it meant until I began to study. But the problem with this interpretation is that it invents the idea that Jesus prefers a cold heart to one with at least some desire. So it's although Jesus is saying, I really wish you were totally against me rather than partially for me, which, which is not something we see ever in the Bible anywhere else. But also in no way does this fit the context of Laodicea as we'll see. Colossae was only 10 miles west, and they had a beautiful, pure source, a spring that provided cold drinking water. 
And even closer, only about six miles to the north, was Hierapolis, uh, renowned for its healing hot spring, which were highly valued for their healing properties. They were renowned among the empire for having these amazing hot springs. And then Colossae had some of the best, purest, coldest drinking water available. And Laodicea, despite having every other comfort because they were so rich, had no springs at all, but relied on the Lycus River, which dried up completely for part of the year. So even you can imagine as this river's drying up, the water quality is getting worse and worse and worse. And then eventually there's no water available from the river. And archaeologists have un- uncovered the remains of a, just a nasty looking aqueduct. I was going to get a picture and I forgot. My apologies. But you can look up uh, Laodicean Aqueduct and see the actual archaeological remains of this pipe that is filled with silt and filth and mineral deposits because they carried water several miles into the city and there was this thick layer of encrustation on the pipes uh, just showing how poor the quality of water was. And on top of that, it had arrived uh, through this long lead too, believe it or not. <laughs> the, the, the water would be tepid and lukewarm. And ultimately, nowadays, we know that it was p- probably poisonous as well. And this is the kind of water that they uh, had for a good deal of the year in Laodicea. So what we see is that Jesus is not contrasting being on fire for him with being cold towards him. Instead, he is comparing the Laodicean believers to their water supply. Cold water is a good thing, right? He he said this cold water would be a good thing, good for drinking. And hot water from heated springs is a good thing, good for health and for relaxation. But the Laodicean Laodicean Christians are neither cold nor hot. They are completely worthless. They are just as offensive to Christ as their lukewarm water was to those who had to drink it. It was tepid, it was gross, it was disgusting, it was poison. And, and Jesus is, is using this uh, point that's so clear to them in their city as a way to rebuke them. Jesus uses this same strong language in the Gospels uh, using a different analogy. Salt. Salt has one redeeming quality, which separates it from silt, from, from just worthless Even dirt has more value because dirt you can grow things in. Salt has one quality that makes it worthwhile. It is salty. Salt was a very valuable commodity in Jesus' day. And yet without the salty taste and effect, it would be utterly worthless. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, we read, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In Matthew, he connects the the necessary quality of this, this salty quality of Christ's disciples with the unhideable light of the gospel. Those who have received the light of Christ will shine that light. Uh, the emphasis, like here in Revelation, is on the life of being a faithful witness that is, is not only necessary, but it is, is essential quality for anyone who would call themselves a believer. In fact, to call oneself a believer and not to be a faithful witness is to contradict the Bible. It's, as a believer, we have one quality that sets us apart. That's a quality of being light bearers. Those who have this gospel, and if we have received this gospel, like a city on a hill, it can't be hidden. Like, like someone who has received something incredible, some incredible gift, undeserved from God, we will share this free gift with others. It's interesting, though, uh, and this is, comes out of my study through the Gospel of Luke, but in Luke's Gospel... He, he subtly changes this emphasis. It's ultimately the same, but from a different perspective or a different direction. The emphasis of the salt parable, it's just as relevant to both this church and, and the Laodicean church. Uh, but the parables of chapter 14 in, in the Gospel of Luke end with a common call to all who would follow Christ. In Luke chapter 14, verse 33 to 35. 
He says, so therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, this is Jesus speaking. This isn't uh, someone's interpretation. This isn't someone's sermon where they've extrapolated and exacted what they want from the scriptures. This is Jesus speaking. He says, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. God, we ask by your Spirit for ears to hear this morning. True discipleship among the wealthy church in Laodicea and here in North America is often choked out by the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things, Mark 4.19. The saltiness required here in Luke is a radically changed economic system which rightly reassigns value from temporary wealth, gold and silver and houses and cars, to things of eternal value like closeness to Christ and faithfully bearing witness to the realities of His kingdom. So in Luke, it it seems so different, but it actually, when we look at this in the Laodicean Christians, it's the exact same thing happening. Matthew puts this in the perspective of those who have this salty flavor, the Christians who have the quality that's required for being called a disciple of Christ are sharing the gospel. But in Luke, it's those who have a radically reassigned economic system, a value system that says the things that Jesus has given us eternally that, that are not of our own works, but his work, the, the treasure we receive in his inheritance for us is so much greater than anything in this life. And it can't help but change the way that we live our lives, especially in the way that we handle our things. This is exactly what's happening with the Laodicean Christians because they have had the desires to have all the comforts of this world uh, start to choke out their desire to serve Jesus faithfully. And they consider themselves able to handle anything that comes their way. They have lost the very thing that made them a church at all. And Jesus levels a very serious warning at this church. A threat repeated. uh, It's taken right from Leviticus chapter 18. Uh, Verse 26, God had warned his covenant people in the Old Testament that if they followed the ways of the nations around them, if they did what the nations around them were doing, then the land would ultimately vomit them out just like it had done with the Canaanites. This was a, a, a covenant curse in the Old Testament, one that Jesus brings up here in the New Testament, that if you are not God's people in the land, he's going to expel you. And the word used is, is to vomit you out. And Jesus is warning his new covenant people in Laodicea that they are in danger of having the same thing happen to them for the exact same reason, that they are living exactly like the people around them. He continues in verse 17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Can you imagine... You consider yourself rich, prosperous, self-assured. And Jesus says, you are not rich. You have nothing. You are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. We start to see here what made the Laodiceans so offensive to Jesus. They had this attitude of total self-sufficiency, an attitude that we have experienced, haven't we, church? An attitude which leads to prayerlessness. An attitude that says, whatever comes our way, we can handle it. Sure, I might have to put it on my MasterCard. Sure, I might have to go uh, to many, 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 many different doctors. Sure, I might have to take up an extra shift, but I can make it. I can do it. I don't want to rely on anyone else, and especially, I don't rely on God. And then we, this leads to prayerlessness, because when we're handling things... When things are our problems and we're going to handle them, we're not concerned about bringing all of our prayers and requests and needs to God as the one who has set us here in this place, the one who has called us here so that we can be in this time and place to be faithful witnesses to the whole world rather than being set on His mission and recognizing that He's going to fund His mission and He's going to provide everything we need to do His mission. We're no longer even on mission and so we're just worried about getting our things and taking care of ourselves like the Laodicean church. 
And this is an attitude which is exactly like the overt rebellion against God mentioned in Romans chapter 1. It's it's overt rebellion against God because it fails to recognize Him as God, glorify Him, and give Him thanks. You know, you don't have to raise a fist against God and use swear words to curse His name and, and to rebel against Him and fail to recognize Him and glorify Him for who He is. You know, when we fail to give thanks to God, when we fail to understand and recognize that He is our provision, He's the one that we're looking to for everything that we need, we don't recognize Him for who He is, and we rebel in our hearts. Like the Laodicean Christians, we are prone to a slow deception. This this slow deception into ignoring God because we think we can, or we think we have to, handle circumstances on our own. Think about the problems that you are dealing with this month, this year. Think about the types of things that you want and you're looking towards, the things that keep you up at night, the things that you're strategizing about. To what extent is God a part of that picture? Have we kept God out of our plans because we know that they're not necessarily His plans, but plans for our own creature comforts and the things that we want out of this world, these temporary things of wealth and comfort? Have we kept God out because we don't think He would necessarily be pleased with our choices of what we plan to do with our time and our money as we go forward, that they do not advance the kingdom of God as we've been called to do here on this earth? Or do we fail to pray and ask God for what we need because we are so certain that we can handle it on our own? Uh, Have the uh, goals and aims that we have for serving Christ become so minimal just holding on, just maintaining that we don't even need to pray because we don't need supernatural power to attain what we've set as our goals for serving Christ. The result in Laodicea was an attitude towards life which was exactly the same as all the culture around them. Think about this, church. Think about how easily we blend in all except for Sunday morning, when we care about the same things, we value the same things, we work for the same things, we desire the same things, we are motivated by the same things as the culture around us. It's not a a salty salt. It is a salt that has lost its flavor. It is a salt that doesn't have a purpose. To be called by Christ's name and to call ourselves His disciples and yet not to do the very first thing which He has called us to do is to, to really be nothing. Remember, Laodicea was able to refuse imperial assistance to rebuild their city. We don't need your charity, they might have said. That they did not need anybody and that included God. Well, they would never say that. We would never say, oh, I don't need God. But our lives make that clear. No, no Christian says, I don't need God. But we live prayerlessly. We live without seeking His wisdom and direction. We live seeking the things that our neighbors seek. Never bringing God into the equation. It's a, it's a life of practical atheism. When we are not solid, set by Christ in the path of seeking His kingdom and His righteousness. If the goal for my life is Christ's kingdom advanced and personal righteousness reflecting the righteousness that he has provided in Christ, I will not cease to be so reliant on God. Because I can't do that. I can't advance the cause of Christ in my own strength. I can't win people for the gospel with my own eloquence and arguments. I'm terrible at it, honestly. I've tried many times. Only when God does a work in the heart and doesn't work in my heart that I'll even share, will people come to Christ? And have I lived in obedience? You know, church, as we go through these letters to the churches, we're seeing a very strong call to personal obedience. Do the things that I call you to, or else, Jesus says over and over again. When we recognize that we must live in obedience to Christ, we will fall to our knees in prayer. Cry out to God. Empower me, Jesus motivate me, discipline me. These are my daily prayers. Motivate me to do what's right today because I'm unmotivated. Help me to desire your ways and your will. Empower me to follow hard after you. In God's eyes, this church was wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Despite all of 
the ways they felt about themselves, and all, all practical, uh, outward-looking eyes would see a well-dressed church, a church that had money for facilities, a, a church that was well taken care of. But the result was the most spiritually impoverished church of all the seven addressed in Asia. He says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Laodicea was a city of extreme wealth, but none of their wealth was of the kind that could help them be overcomers, could help them conquer. Church, here in North America, we have extreme wealth compared to the rest of the world, and none of that wealth is of any benefit to helping us to overcome and, and receive the promised reward. First Timothy 6, 9-10, to among many scriptures, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The church of Laodicea, like many Christians today, thought they could follow Jesus and continue to pursue the comforts and values of this world. Isn't that what we want? We just really want some way, you know, and I was recognizing the idols of my own heart in recent weeks and asking God to reveal to me uh, where some of my, my temptation and sin issue is coming out of in, in this idol factory of a heart that I, I possess. God was showing me that I, I desire two things. I desire to be known for serving Him and I desire to have things easy and have my comforts. A divided goal. A divided goal that doesn't work. We can't serve two masters. Laodicea thought they could follow Jesus and pursue everything that this world had to offer. And Jesus, we've already seen, commanded his disciples that anyone who would follow him must lay down everything this world has to offer. All temporary wealth, temporary respect, temporary relationships to pursue Christ. The citizens of Laodicea are are told that they're naked and ashamed that they should buy clothing from Christ. Again, we, how are they buying things without, without gold? I, I don't know. We're, we're going to get to that. But the citizens of Laodicea wore beautiful clothing that was distinct throughout the empire uh, because it was a, a, a very valuable local product, a, a, glass, a glossy sorry, black wool. So you, they have this very natural, beautiful black wool clothing. They have massive flocks of, of black sheep. And it's very valuable commodity throughout the empire. But, but a citizen of Laodicea wore these black clothing. And, and Jesus is calling this church to come to him to be dressed in white as a citizen of heaven rather than proudly as a citizen of Laodicea. You know, these people who are richly clothed, Jesus says, you're, you're naked. You need something else. And we're going to see this white clothing come up again and again and again through the rest of Revelation as a, as a necessary covering, the covering of Christ for those who follow him. But for, to be covered by Christ, we can't cover ourselves. We are always trying to find ways to cover ourselves, to find ourselves to be righteous, to, find, to, to um, vindicate ourselves, to find our own righteousness. And Christ says, no, you, you, you're poor not only are you poor, but you're naked. You're, the coverings you've covered yourself with are, are not sufficient. Come to me to be clothed in white. Laodicea was known for its famous school of medicine that used a, a powder or an, an ointment for treating their eyes and ears. They, they produced this famous product. And Jesus makes it clear that their particular vision problem, their blindness, cannot be cured by anyone but him. Can you imagine you're proud about the medical care that you have in your, in your city. We feel that way sometimes here in Canada, sometimes not, depending. We, we're proud about the kind of clothes that we can afford. We're, we're proud that we don't have to rely on anybody else. And Jesus, with this sharp rebuke, says, not only are you poor, not only are you naked, but you're blind too. Come to me for salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Christians, believers here today, we need to stop thinking 
and living like Laodiceans and start thinking and living like followers of Christ. We have to start, stop thinking and living like citizens of Camrose in Canada and uh, Alberta and start thinking like those who have a great treasure, a home in heaven with Jesus. Their earthly riches mask a deep spiritual poverty. A poverty that was so overwhelming. A poverty that was so big in their lives that they did not even notice their problem. This is true poverty. That not only were they so poor and naked and pitiable, but they couldn't even see the problem. This is so common. that It's the sin of our own lives that we can't see. We can be those who, who can notice everything everyone else is doing wrong and the way they should have done it better and really be someone who has a deep spiritual poverty that's not even in our line of sight. We don't even notice. Jesus invites these poor people, by his estimation, to come to him and buy what they need. Well, how, how can they do that when Jesus says that they're destitute? Does he want them to trade in their, their gold bars and their fancy clothes for some spiritual rewards? No, Jesus wasn't a prosperity teacher. <laughs> he was, he's, he's telling them that they're, they're the coin of the kingdom. There's a way in which they can buy from him the things that they need, true riches. Come to me and buy from me gold, pure gold. How are they going to buy pure gold when what they have is nothing? So that you may be rich. Come And white garments. How are they going to buy white garments if their gold is worthless in Jesus' sight? Spiritual poverty can always be solved with something that every Christian possesses. There's, a, there's such grace here. There's such a, a clear response that Jesus gives. Every one of us possesses the coin of the kingdom. We, have, we are rich with it whether we realize it or not. The ability to turn in repentance and live as faithful witnesses. To live in faithful devotion to Christ despite the cost. Even if that cost is financial ruin. Even if that cost is the loss of friends. Even if that cost is the loss of respect and reputation. Even if that cost, as we've seen in Revelation, is ultimately death. Jesus can make us rich with the coin of the kingdom with which we buy from Him gold refined by fire. Which, with which we buy from Him white garments so that we're not ashamed. With which we buy salve to anoint our eyes so that we can see. Jesus invites them, come in repentance despite the cost. Matthew 13, 44-45, two quick parables Jesus tells that, that just exemplify this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field where a man found, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had to, and bought it. This, this price would seem exorbitantly high if not for the priceless nature of of that which is obtained from Jesus. And not only that, but the judgment for failure described at the end of Revelation. If we have these great treasures set before us and a great destruction set before us if we fail. And Jesus says, choose life or death. Choose life. Church, we, we've been given the way. We've been motivated by the Holy Spirit. We've been empowered by the Holy Spirit and convicted by the Holy Spirit to turn in repentance to Christ. And, and Jesus says, verse 19, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He's very clear with this church, very graceful to this church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus' harsh rebuke and strong hand of discipline all flow out of his love for the very ones who have snubbed him, the ones who are meeting in their church and Jesus is not there but kept on the outs. These are the people that Jesus loves, rebukes, and disciplines. Psalm 23, 4 talks about his rod and his staff being a comfort. And, and I never understood that passage 
until I understood this idea that Jesus loves those he disciplines. This is, honestly, church, from, from a personal experience, this is how I know that God has his hand on my life. I don't look at my life and see the good things I've done and say, wow, well, God must have done, done something to me. I mean, I, sometimes I, I can see where the Holy Spirit's done a work, but I can't weigh out all the good and bad things I've done in my life and say, oh man, I deserve heaven. But I can look at my life and see the discipline of God on my life. I see where he has disciplined me in very painful ways. I see where he has led me away from temptation. I see where where Christ is at work driving me away from the things that were my desires and making it so that I find no comfort in sin. And this is how I know that God's hand is at work. And it is such a comfort. You know, if any of you struggle with knowing, am I really a believer? Is God really at work in my life? Is the Holy Spirit really doing a work in me? Look no further than to be comforted by the the strong discipline of the Lord, which is totally scary. It's nothing you ever want to go through in the sense of how it feels. And then when it happens, you're like, thank you, God. That you are my rescue. He, I, it's not only that sheep know their shepherd's voice and follow him, but they also rely on their shepherd to drive them out of danger and drive them onto the next pasture when they don't want to finish or they don't want to move on until they've finished what they're doing here. In the midst of expressing his displeasure at the church's present state, Jesus extends this grace and an opportunity to repent, this valued coin of the kingdom. Jesus is blunt about their current state, which shakes them into the realizing the reality of the situation. Sometimes we need someone to just grab us by the shirt and be like, wake up, open your eyes, look at your life. It doesn't seem very graceful to us. It seems kind of legalistic when someone gets in our face and says, look how you disobey God. It's not okay. But this is what Jesus does to these churches. He sends them letter after letter after letter that says, the way that you're doing things is not okay. Wake up. We see some churches better, I guess, than Laodicea, where he praises them for a lot of the things. And he says, but this I have against you. He's not willing to just praise them for the good things. You know, if we're as parents just praise our children for the good things and give them no discipline, we end up with some pretty lousy children. God is our Father, and He disciplines the ones that He loves. It is such a comfort. It is such a joy to know that we are those who are loved of God because He disciplines us. Jesus is not among them as they gather together to worship. Even though there's more than two or three gathered even though they gather together calling themselves by his name, you know, they're, they're gathered in two or three and they call themselves by his name. Doesn't the Bible say Jesus will be there? That's actually a really terrible interpretation of what that means in that passage. But it's also something that gathering in his name means more than just saying they are Christians or more than putting a cross on their building. He's not there when they gather. Uh, I don't want to get too far off into this, but this is one of the more popular verses in all of Revelation that people usually use in the sense of evangelism. You know, if Jesus is knocking on the door to your heart, if you'll just open up your heart and let him in, you'll be a Christian. This is actually not what it's talking about here at all because he's talking to a church, just people in the church, and he's saying to this church, and what did they do when they gathered together as a church? They ate the Lord's Supper. Just as we're going to do in a moment here, we, we gather together to have this close, intimate fellowship with God. We have been invited to the Lord's table. It's His table. And, and in this culture, in the ancient world, eating together was, was something you only did with very close friends and family. It, it symbolized sharing life together at the very deepest of level. And, and how rich is the compassion Jesus has towards his followers here, even though they're the ones that have kicked him out, even though they're the ones that have snubbed him and rebelled against him, although he has founded this church in Laodicea, he is inviting them back to his table. But he he puts it in a very ironic way because they're at the Lord's table together and he's on the outside. He is not with them, but he's knocking. He's not willing to just stay outside. 
He's not just, it's not just up to them whether they will turn back to him, but he is actively seeking relationship with this church again. And he does so in a very effective way by this message that he pens through John to this church with this strong condemnation, a harshly worded rebuke that says, wake up, you are poor and pitiable and blind. You have nothing and you are doomed. He is not among them as they gather together for worship. He has been left outside, knocking so that someone might invite him in. But there's so much grace in this. Uh, After the realities of this church are revealed, they don't please him in their worship. They make him want to vomit. They are, in fact, an affront and a disgust to him. Jesus will come in to them and enjoy the intimate fellowship that is promised with this failure of a church. If only they will repent and invite him into their gathering. To the one who conquers. Verse 21. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus' final promise to those who conquer, it's so far beyond anything we would ever ask. I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever, ever met anyone bold enough to ask Jesus, can I sit on your throne? He had two disciples, remember, that asked, can we sit on your right and left? And that was such hubris. They, the pride in those guys that they would ask to sit on Christ's right and left. But nobody would ask him, can I have your throne? This is what Jesus offers. This reigning with Christ, described as sitting with Jesus on his throne, just as he sits on the Father's throne. But he's very clear what it takes to be the one who conquers in this passage. If it's, if it's been fuzzy for you up until now, it is very clear how we can be, church, those who conquer. Be zealous. And it requires this total change in value system. It requires that we don't have a divided focus seeking to live the American or Canadian dream in this case and seeking Christ, but that we seek only Him. Seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And trusting that he will provide everything that we need to fulfill the mission that he has sent us on because this is a temporary place. We have to recognize our spiritual poverty in order to receive true riches from Christ, church. Those of us who think we've got it together, when we think that we can handle it, when we think we know enough, When we think we've done enough, we are the very ones who are pitiable and wretched and naked, but do not recognize the true reality of the situation. We have to, in repentance, recognize our spiritual poverty in order to receive true riches. There is no other way. This is why he puts it in the statement of buying gold and buying white clothes. Because the the coin of the kingdom is repentance recognizing our utter need for Christ. And and church, this is not something you ever get past. This is what they've done in Laodicea. They had come and repented and become Christians and and been baptized, a baptism of repentance and the Holy Spirit. They were true believers, believe it or not. The Bible talks about them being His people, the ones He loves, who He will discipline. Good news. Good news. And yet he has a very harsh warning with a very, very bad scenario if they they did not obey and turn in repentance. You don't get past this point. If you are at the point where now you are a mature Christian and you've done what's needed and you've got things figured out and you no longer have a spiritual poverty that you are so desperate for the riches of Christ, brother or sister, you are blind. Brother or sister, you are wretched and pitiable and your shame is evident. Not only to God, but those around you when you have this sort of pride. But when you recognize your fundamental need for a Savior even today, when you recognize the fundamental need for Christ's riches because I have none, when you recognize that we come today with nothing in our hands because there's nothing we can do for, with eternal, of any eternal significance with the things that we own other than to lay them at Christ's feet. 
We are the ones who are wretched and pitiable and blind. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, let us humbly repent and invite Christ into fellowship with us this morning. This is, this is what this table is all about. This is not the table of those who are the Lord's, but this is the Lord's table that we each come to, because, not because we are worthy, but because He is worthy. We come to Him seeking His riches, gold refined in fire, as we remember what He has done for us. There's a spiritual significance. There's a reason. It's not a, this is not a, a magical ritual, but there's a reason why we come in remembrance of Christ's work because it's a work that utterly devastates our pride and elevates His glory. And this is what we dwell on. This is what we remember. We dwell here at the foot of the cross, remembering Christ's work.